Hello, everyone, and welcome back for the final talk of Hope 2020. Before we jump into the talk, we want to again thank you all, attendees, presenters, and volunteers. Your commitment to Hope and to our community have made this event possible even in these difficult and trying times. So next up is Charlie Myers. Charlie's worked on autonomous vehicles and has begun a PhD program in Sweden that focuses on the intersections of computer security, embedded devices, and machine learning. His talk today is titled Borders and Biometrics, Boundaries of Computer, of computer Vision, and we'll discuss how machine learning, in particular facial recognition technology, has been rapidly adopted and deployed by law enforcement as a way to justify sen sentencing, policing focus, and border control. We'll have a QA session with Charlie after his talk, so be sure to submit your questions via the matrix chat window. Now, over to you, Charlie. Take it away, ground control. I hope you're enjoying Hope 2020, and uh, I'm simply mathematics, uh, my GitHub handle at least, um, and uh, this talk is from Borders to Biometrics, the Boundaries of Surveillance. So a little bit about me. I have a Bachelor's of Science in Applied Mathematics and a Master's of Science in Data Science, both from CUNY. I founded uh, a nonprofit in New York City uh, that provides free Wi-Fi and built um, a super node and wrote some firmware for it. And I, then I worked on self-driving vehicles at uh, Volkswagen on the verification and validation team. And now I investigate adversarial attacks on machine learning as part of my PhD in Sweden. So my research interests include machine learning and machine learning security, um, especially in the context of data privacy and anonymization. And machine learning is a huge field. I'm less interested in building new models and more interested in verifying ones that are already deployed and making sure that they can handle outliers and um, that, for example, a self-driving car system trained in Germany will work in uh, other places around the world, whether due to uh, difficulties in predicting different weather or different pedestrian patterns or um, just detecting people differently based on the color of their skin. And uh, I, this hasn't been so much of a problem yet, but in the future, um, adversarial attacks on machine learning systems will be cheap and uh, widely available. And so we need to prove that our machine learning models are capable of uh, ignoring these or defending against them. And a lot of this comes down to uh, distributed and or parallel processing um, because we have to do a lot of things um, very quickly uh, in machine learning. That's that's the whole point to deal with uh, gigabytes or terabytes or petabytes of data. And in particular for um, this field, it's important because you end up doing a lot of subset analysis or a lot of um, like model optimization in ways that can be totally parallelized. Um, so you can either um, throw more cores at it or throw more time at it, and usually um, processes are cheaper. And so, and but going into this, uh, you know, there's there's an upper limit to the number of cores you can have, and so for certain models and certain certain applications, uh, it has to be done in a distributed fashion. And so collectively, this is called trustworthy machine learning. It's a growing kind of new field. It's pretty interesting. Check it out. And so in this talk, um, you should expect a, a brief crash course on machine learning, a brief history of facial recognition systems, of survey of machine learning based surveillance systems, and fun ways to break them. So what is AI? Well, it's kind of a hard question to answer. Um, these terms don't mean a whole lot and encompass a lot of um, statistical and probabilistic um, ideas that wouldn't be totally foreign to anyone taking undergraduate math courses, uh, like linear algebra uh, or, or calculus. Um, what I, um, and they're deterministic, so they're like mathematical machines. Uh, you, you put some numbers in, uh, you get a result, and it can be replicated over and over. Um, so it's inaccurate to say that we 
don't have an idea how machine learning or particular neural networks work. It's just that the decision steps they take are not the decision steps we take, and we have to do extra work to make um, their decision steps interpretable. Um, and really, this is a weakness rather than a magic feature. Um, there, it's you know we think of it as like emergent intelligence, but as we'll see today, it's. Um, just as much emergent stupidity. So machine learning um, pipelines, as they're called, are made up of a bunch of interlocking software components where you have some like, um, data um, that is fed into like a model uh, that's fit to it. Um, there may or may not be like new user input in the case of like a recommender system from Spotify or Amazon or Google, uh, you need that user input. Um, and then there's some kind of output. Uh, since we're looking at facial recognition systems, um, it will, um, you know, the, you'll see person A, person B as the choice on all of these diagrams. Um, and a little note here is that uh, your you can only train your facial recognition systems on an explicit set of people. If I train a model to uh, you know, pick people out of the Senate, it will not make any sense to apply that model to people in uh, the House of Representatives. Um, so that's not necessarily obvious to a lot of people, but the, the boundaries of your model are uh, defined uh, explicitly by the boundaries of your data set. And for these class classification problems, um, there's not really any work that's gone into um, exploring beyond uh, explicit classification. Uh, the problem is there's a bunch of ways to attack it, um, these systems. Uh, you can poison it. You can uh, evade detection. And you can attack the model itself and get access to its parameters um, called uh, model inversion attack. Uh, or you can look at the output from a bunch of model queries um, maybe by using their paid service or um, similar, um, or using a proxy model you built yourself, you can um, reproduce the original data, uh, which is terrifying in the context of facial recognition systems, because that means that a particularly motivated attacker could find uh, all of the individuals that comprise the original data set. Um, so there are a couple ways to divide machine learning systems, um, and they fall into like regression or classification um, category, where regression is uh, like this. You may be familiar with Excel, where you have a bunch of uh, data and you're trying to draw a line that in this case in the um, in this case uh, this might be housing prices and you have a bunch of other variables that go in to determine that and you fit your line um, to it and then there are classification problems where you're less trying to find a function uh, that approximates your the collection of your data but you're trying to function you try to find a function that separates your data um, as you can see here um, these are a bunch of different ways to do that additionally um, this is a supervised system in that um, your housing prices are a known value um, the y value and your uh, other and your other variables are also known um, x and so you you can evaluate uh, the error explicitly. Um, now, these are unsupervised systems. Uh, the orange and blue data uh, are there for us to see um, how these things uh, clustered them. But there is to say like no correct answer here. Um, and um, because this is unsupervised, these don't have in, inside and outside labels. Um, and so you have to come up with other techniques to build um, some kind of confidence in the results. Um, so facial recognition systems have been around from, for decades, um, since the 60s. Some of the earliest systems 
um, on computers were built for facial recognition systems, precisely because of the military applications. Um, so because of the military applications, uh, it was very important to get this done. And it originated uh, by laboriously uh, measuring people's faces, like the width of their nose or the distance between their eyes, and creating a, a data sheet for each person, um, which would stand up pretty well to like any problems with scaling or rotation or uh, aging. Um, and so, but um, it was very laborious and it took a long time to, to do these measurements. So you needed kind of a captive audience uh, of vo volunteers to get the faces from. And so Microsoft, IBM, and the US Army created internal database created internal databases of this that were massive in the 90s so that um, they can move beyond um, these small scale tests popular within like a small university computer science department. Um, one of these data sets became the ferret data set, which has been widely cited and widely used. Now models rely on 3D face scans, images, or videos, and have upwards of 99.999% accuracy for some groups of people. However, um, there are problems with gender and racial disparity. Um, and MIT researcher Joy Bulanwini, I hope I'm not butchering her name, um, and uh, the current George Floyd street protests have brought this into this, this technology into the spotlight and several vendors have withdrawn them from the market, including Microsoft um, and IBM. Um, historically, there have been different uh, detection methods. There are like matrix decomposition techniques that work well on other types of signal data, like, um, like for example, um, one, one technique is very good for isolating sound in the noisy room. Um, the, but and the math does not work out very well for facial detection systems. It peaks around eighty percent accuracy. Um, landmark based detections do do better because they're robust to scaling and aging and facial and small facial feature changes. Um, and then there's correlation searches, which work on like average faces, um, looking at like a sum of average faces. Um, for that define a face or averaging each class so that each class has a kind of like meta prototypical face uh, and comparing these to some input face. Um, but these are also like matrix decomposition algorithms beaten by glasses, facial hair, aging, head rotation, and many minor variation in the person's um, face. And so neural networks um, overcome all of these and can you know, figure out their own features, uh, like no, like the location of the nose, um, by themselves. But they do this at the cost to security. So here's an example of the like matrix decomposition uh, faces. These are called eigenfaces, where essentially you have um, a collection of independent, these are not in individual spaces, but these are um, kind of prototypical faces that can be used to distinguish in individual faces. And uh, the math of this is maybe like four or five, ends up being like four or five lines of code uh, versus modern systems where you have these massive neural networks that um, have a bunch of way have a bunch of convolutional layers that uh, pass these cascading filters um, across and compression, and then you repeat this process several times, and then at the end you get an output of uh, probabilities, and you find the one that has the the highest, and you say that's that's the face uh, you think it is, and it's this like very strange uh, mathematical machine that uh, can have many millions or billions or hundreds of billions of parameters. 
but you know, in between those decomposition systems and uh, neural networks, there is the, the Viola, Viola Jones algorithm. And what it does is it turns a set of it turns an image into a set of geometric features, and um, it quickly rejects images that don't have certain features. And so, uh, and the way it does that is by looking at these, looking at an image through these filters. So it will take some like raw image data um, in black and white, and it'll pass it through, or sorry, it will multiply it against um, another matrix. Um, which in this case, uh, in the case of A, would be zeros on the left-hand side and 255 on the right-hand side for a three-bit image or three-byte image. Um, so, and what that does is it essentially looks for a long uh, vertical line, and then the the B. Uh, we'll look for like a short horizontal line, the C will look for a short, short vertical line, and the D will look for a diagonal. And um, it picks, and the algorithm uh, picks these filters in such a way uh, that is designed to quickly reject things that are not faces um, because it has to do this uh, kind of filtering and, um, across many different orders of scale. Um, this algorithm works on an image with a single face as well as uh, images of a crowd of people. Um, so the problem is that a lot of the research in the 90s um, was based on these groups that do not reflect the human population. Um, they were like overwhelmingly white and male, as we can see from this chart. I took um, kind of more typical data sets, the, the ferret developed by the army in the 90s, and the labeled faces in the wild data set, which is a collection of the most famous celebrities. So overwhelmingly like Hollywood actors and um, disproportionately like American and white. And uh, then there's Fairface, which is a data set that was intentionally created to be um, as close as possible to um, an actual human um, random sample. Um, so as we can see that when we look at the, the luminance value of, of the, the people in these images, or at least the foreground, um, we find that um, you have almost like a bimodal distribution for the ferret database, which is the smallest one down here. And um, so it's not very good. We would expect this to be normally distributed. Um, and um, then for the LFW data set, it is normally distributed. Um, and it looks fine until we realize that um, both of these data sets are significantly lighter than what we would expect from um, a, a data set built from that built from uh, randomly from the people on the planet. And so what the what this means exactly is that these detection systems that are used to inform you know where faces are um, in the automation um, then get used as part of the data collection process, uh, as part of the training process, and as part of this like cyclical kind of like spiral uh, of things being ignored. And you know, it's it's not so bad um, because um, as we can see, um, things are generally detected. Um, the ferret data set. Uh, performs the worst here because it includes um, like profile pictures, as in like people turning the left or right or at 45 degree angles. And there are different Viola Jones detectors are trained specifically on those angles. And um, this one was trained just specifically for frontal. Um, so this verifies that like um, this does not work very well on rotational um, changes. 
But what we see here is that the open face detector um, performs much better on the celebrity data set than it does on the real population data set. And perhaps that's due to uh, problems in the training stage. I don't really know because the open face uh, system is, is proprietary, or at least the data they use to train it on is proprietary or not released. I don't know if anyone actually has business interest in it. Um, and we can see that this carries out in um, the racial performance. And in Fairface, when we look at different um, different racial groups of people, we find that um, the, you know, the difference between the smallest and largest um, gap is around 1%, um, which is totally fine. Um, that would totally would be definitely in the range of statistical randomness. Um, it, but uh, that is not true for the, the like eight and a half and 11% we see um, in Farrah and LFW. So we see that when we use these bias detectors to build facial recognition systems um, or facial recognition data sets that become those systems, uh, we have this cascading problem where 10% of the people uh, who are where um, it's 99% accurate for white males and 89 to 85% accurate for minor minority groups. And so I started looking into why why this would be happening um and i looked into open face and open tv uh, which are two big um, libraries for doing this kind of facial recognition system and i found in their source code that with deep down that they're both installing pillow i mean sorry dlib they're both installing dlib um which is a, a library developed in the 90s that uses this uh, via the Jones detection algorithm trained on the overwhelmingly white data set. And what we see here is uh, precisely that, that um, when we have these, oh, when we train it on uh, these overwhelmingly white data sets, our, our performance goes way, way down. So this is the open. This is the DLib detector uh, versus the neural network based one in OpenFace, and uh, we've seen the best case. Our uh, detection system is as about as good as a coin flip, and in the worst case, it, it only detects uh, one uh, ten percent of the faces. And you know that was really abstract and kind of like hard to like. Conceptualized, but so I found this Verge report um, from Pol uh, about this algorithm called Pulse, which is which depixelates images. Um, and I um, looked into Pulse and found what it was using as its base um, detector in its in the uh, generative adversarial network it was using to create the new image, the novel images. And it turns out it was using DLib. And so um, DLib is uh, taking this pixelated picture of Obama on the left. And uh, because of the way it is encoded uh, white and maleness, it um, produces the images on the right. Um, so there's a saying in machine learning uh, that is always, always, always true. Garbage in, garbage out. Um, the the data used to train these systems is very, very important. So um, this is part of the Fairface study, and they evaluated several different data sets for the racial composition. And so here's what it is. Um, so one of the ways that um, our models become inaccurate is through bias, uh, bias that we didn't intend to include. And it's bias that comes from 
um, larger systems in society, in data collection methods, in you know, what kinds of things get funding, and et cetera. Um, and then there's um, intentional attacks, which um, we have discussed a bit. Uh, and the famous example is um, having a, a few pieces of tape on a stop sign will make uh, this uh, an autonomous vehicle think this is a speed limit sign, which could have disastrous consequences. And so as I said a little bit before, there's four different types of attacks. Poisoning, where you inject data to uh, into the training process so that you can manipulate the model. And then there's evasion, where um, you're trying to get uh, the model to misclassify um, some some data. Either um, you you want it to, um, for example, misclassify your spam as ham, or misclassify your botnet as a legitimate user. And then there's uh, data extraction, um, where you uh, or extraction attacks. Uh, where you extract uh, the model itself and create a, a copy of it through uh, examining enough of the input-output pairs. And then you can actually create a copy of the input data by doing the same thing. Um, so we've got poisoning and evasion. Um, so poisoning attacks the model and evasion attacks the user input. Um, and they're essentially the same, but um, mathematically speaking or conceptually speaking, they just happen at different points in the process, uh, like whether it happens before or after training. But the general idea is that you have some kind of like class boundary. And uh, with poisoning, you introduce a, a new data point that, that shifts this class boundary such that um, things are misclassified. And with uh, evasion, you do this in such a way that your malicious attack falls on the other side of the line here. Um, and so they're essentially the same, and they are rooted in this like geometric interpretation of the data. Um, and here, you know, we have these two-dimensional data sets, and where this gets tricky is we have very when, when we have very large data set, sets that might have like tens or hundreds of dimensions. Um, so like your average uh, megapixel image has a million dimensions uh, because each pixel becomes its own independent vector. And so, um, you know, it's it becomes impossible to like represent um, images in this way. Um, and so what this means is tiny, tiny numerical coincidences can sum up in such a way across these millions, this million vectors, um, that we can have um, things very confidently misclassified by the detection systems. Um, and as you can see, you add an imperceptible amount of noise to this image of a panda, and you can convince the computer that it is a gibbon. And in fact, uh, it's it is more confident this adversarial adversarial gibbon exists than it was that this um, benign panda existed in the beginning. And then there's inversion attacks, uh, which uh, look at the output from the model. Uh, and so, model output. Um, these days is from these neural networks um, where you have convolutional systems um, defined by um, these this mathematical formula at the top where you have um, two sums uh, and uh, two functions f and g where um, f is just sliding across um, the frame that g that is g so if g is like a 10 by 10 grid then f is sliding across that 10 by 10 grid um, so that every um, block of cells is evaluated uh, separately and at different scales 
And that's what a convolution is, this fancy star symbol. And then neural networks are just like a bunch of those convolutions with some weights. Uh, so the convolution is happening in the dots and then the weights are the lines between the dots and they add up. And then you have like some input space where you have like image data and then you have a bunch of convolutional layers and then you have some kind of like output layer that produces a probability that you, in, that you can interpret as a class um, classification. Now, I know that was uh, a little hard to understand, but hopefully this image helps. And so you, what convolution does is you have some like input image uh, G and some function F, and then you get some feature map, and then it keeps doing this kind of like reduction and compression until you end up with just a probability at the end. Um, and so, but the, the main problem is when we look at all of these systems, um, they're just kind of simple linear algebra steps. Like you have some additions, you've got some multiplications. I mean, you've got some vector multiplication, um, but in no case, but none of these um, functions are really safe or crypt cryptographically safe. Uh, that is, they are invertible. And so um, all you really need is um, a certain number of observations um, for a certain number of parameters. Um, it's in those have to in the um, to determine some function uh, that inverses uh, the model itself. And so um, what we find is that this is now just a linear problem where we have, with linear constraints. And that means that if we have 10 parameters in the model, we only need 10 observations. And um, certainly this slows us down a little bit on this, uh, in the sense that uh, neural networks can have hundreds of billions of parameters. But uh, I can also train a proxy model that approximates your model um, fairly accurately with a, a much smaller number of parameters. So I might only meet, need a few million um, or you know, tens of thousands, which in the age of automation and cloud computing is relatively trivial, especially since a lot of these services um, are set up as paid services. So they wouldn't necessarily see your exploratory attacks as malicious if you're paying them for them. Um, now, outside of the context of facial recognition systems, um, these kinds of attacks have huge potential to disrupt like financial markets because uh, you have high speed traders competing with each other um, to make to move very large chunks of the market very quickly. And if um, Goldman Sachs knows that Chase is going uh, to move a certain direction, uh, but at the same time Chase does, then they can hedge against that and manipulate the market. Um, and at the same time, if a botnet or a, a hacker wanted to um, create a DDoS attack, um, it would be it would be easy to do this with these techniques because you could um, have a just massive distributed system that is constantly probing like Cloudflare or Google to get through their DDoS protections and figure out what parameters do and don't work. And uh, at the same time, um, this attack also allows um, for deep fakes, as we'll see. So there's an inference attack, um, which um, instead of just exposing the model, exposes the original data. Um, and it works under the same mathematical assumptions that um, you need as many input output pairs as were dimensions in the original data. Um, again, that's a kind of a oversimplified term. Uh, you could, um, you could potentially do this with a, a small fraction of the number of uh, dimensions. Um, so if this is a, a one megapixel image, 
uh, that's you know a million dimensions, then you might be you might be able to get away with only ten thousand input output pairs, um, which sounds like a lot, but isn't in the scale of cloud computing. And so, what what does that mean? Well, there's there's widespread use. Um, facial recognition systems are used by Frontex um, to track immigrants across Europe. Um, particularly because a lot of people are coming from war-torn places and don't necessarily have identity documents. Um, they're already being used in airports in the U.S. and the EU. Um, in the EU, I ran into one uh, last year um, that had um, that was being used to replace passports in the wake of COVID. Uh, I guess that was this year. Wow, that seems like it was a long time ago. Um, so it was it was being used to replace passports so no one had to touch anything. And it was running Windows XP, which was a little terrifying. And even recently, they were, they've were they been used in uh, upstate New York for safety to make sure that like everyone on campus was uh, supposed to be on campus. And that was very controversial. Um, additionally, uh, the there's been reports that the NYPD has been using uh, Amazon's facial recognition system um, to find suspects using just composite sketches, which as you can see, um, the systems do a good job of matching the sketches, but that humans are failing to accurately represent um, the people in their memory when the sketch is happening. And so um, these systems are, you know, with very high confidence matching people, but these people, the people they're matching are not guilty. Um, and this runs um, against NYPD's internal data that says um, there were only five misidentifications out of what appears to be nearly or slightly more than um, 10,000 uh, uses of the technology. So there's um, some disagreement between the press and the NYPD about what's going on, how widespread and how useful these tools are. Um, so I mentioned uh, Joy Bulamwini um, uh, at the beginning of the talk, but I wanted to bring up her, uh, her research. Um, and so she did a great job of evaluating commercial systems. Um, and so she you know, use IBM and the uh, OpenFace and Microsoft and Adiant's, um systems commercially to evaluate them against uh, disparities in gender and skin tone. And as you can see, like m males uh, outperform females and lighter people outperform darker people. Um, and this is from 2017. And we find that after her first work was published, um, things began to change. Um, you can see that the audit um, produced um, reduced error across all, um, all areas uh, in a year, but particularly for darker female and darker male, um, which is good because those were being under, those were not doing well. So that um, this follow-up research, as you can see, was done in 2018. So in 2020, um, the FF su uh, sues the Trump administration in calling these a threat to civil liberties and privacy because Americans cannot take precaution against the covert or mass and uh, capture of images. Um, San Francisco and Boston banned the use of facial recognition by law enforcement. Um, the EU considered a ban, but stalled uh, amid COVID and some uh, difficulties in dealing or um, dealing with Frontex um, and the uh, in Interpol. And this has already been rolled, but however, this has been rolled out in airports in the U.S. and Europe, and the EU ban wouldn't have covered it anyway, since it only uh, was considered for public spaces. And these tools are already used for um, repression and surveillance in China's uh, Uyghur internment camps. And so this is like actively a huge problem. And so
So, but what's interesting is, is they're still very fragile. Like we went over all the ways to attack them and all you're really doing is shifting this boundary condition, which no matter where I drown this boundary condition, I can always craft an example that allows me to shift it. Here's a t-shirt. As you can see, all of these other people are detected, but this guy uh, is not even shown up to be a person. Uh, this woman is confused to be, is, uh, is thought to be a bunch of license plates because she's overloading uh, the sensors. Uh, this breaks the Viola Jones detection algorithm because it uh, undermines a set, uh, essential functions about uh, eyebrows and uh, the bridge of one's nose and how those appear geometrically to a camera. And uh, the Department of Homeland Security is now worried about um, COVID masks um, and how they play a role in uh, the George Floyd protests and how, uh, and they're afraid that uh, subversive groups will use the occasion um, of face of public face masks to to do vandalism and other riotous acts, um, which is funny because they sell these anti-surveillance like face masks on Amazon that combine the techniques seen in the T-shirt with the just covering your face, um, and this is even into the world of high fashion. This is called. Um, Dazzle makeup, and uh, this designer um, uh, has come up with different ways to to break facial recognition systems. Uh, as you can see, they rely on like playing with the geometry and the assumptions and the shadowing in human faces. And then finally, uh, we've got this other system which projects a uh, constantly morphing face onto your own, kind of like a Rorschach mask. And so, you know, these, these systems are trivial to break. Um, they're very dangerous. Um, they're very accurate, but only under narrow circumstances that are intended by the original researchers. And I th hope you know at least a little bit of how to uh, deal with these systems now. And I hope you enjoyed my talk. So thanks, Charlie. That was a super enlightening talk. So could you tell us a little bit more about, or a little bit about how you got into the field of facial recognition? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say that's my field. Um, the mathematics is pretty generic and works for all kinds of classification problems. So um, the same, you can, if you have a different data set, the same tools can be used to differentiate a stop sign from like a speed limit sign, for example. Um, I, I chose the topic though, because it was, uh, it's been in the news a lot recently. And I was particularly inspired by an MIT researcher, uh, Joy uh, Bulamwini, uh, I'm sure I but butchered her name, but she had investigated the commercial offerings like G Cloud and AWS and uh, the Microsoft uh, um, tools for facial recognition uh, that we know to be used by law enforcement. And it evaluated their uh, efficacy on rating people based on things like gender and skin tone and race. And since she had established that um, these algorithms were, were racist, um, I, was, I was interested in why. And so um, I took this approach where I looked at a bunch of different uh, data sets to come to, to uh, show that it wasn't like a function of the models, but it's a function of the data and this like long history of like how these things get built and how these like systemic things uh, influence these models like decades later. So how, how many parallels are there between the work you did on autonomous vehicles and what you're doing now? Is it um, so I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't really do, uh, so I was on the verification and validation team. So my, my goal, like I would get uh, vehicles more or less uh, from the factory um, and plus our computer systems. And I would do provisioning and setup and that kind of stuff. And I would make sure, and then I would verify like the continual operations of the systems. But um, where the, the idea for the, actual paper came up was from a discussion over lunch there where I was talking to uh, one of the guys from the computer vision team 
And I was, I asked him how they were dealing with this, like this racism problem. And if they had, you know, come up with some statistical technique uh, in particular, because we are in Germany, which isn't, you know, known to be very diverse. Um, you know, how are these things going? How are these cars going to then play out in Dubai or India or New York City where things are, where people look very different. And uh, we, it became a big company wide discussion actually um, around this topic of like, you know, how do we, how do we prevent this from happening to our systems? And um, I mean, we really didn't have an answer at the time. So uh, I wanted to take some of the first steps and then I found this PhD program, uh, which was expanding on this idea of like, uh, how do we how do we trust a model beyond like some accuracy? Like, what it, what does it mean for ninety? What does it mean for it to be ninety nine percent accurate on like some test data set relative to the real world? Or you know, and can we find these implicit biases before um, before we try to implement them in models? So there's some some back and forth in the chat especially about the portion of your presentation talking about masks, the effect of masks and trying to foil facial recognition technology and elaborate a little bit more on that. In particular, there's a question falling onto that about would wearing reflective sunglasses actually work such as like a mirror kind? So, um, so what I found is there is, so in general, for these complex neural network systems in particular, there will always be some uh, some uh, adversarial attack you can do, and it, it might always be slightly different. But there will there will always be some boundary condition that you can reshape, or or it's like play with play, or you can have some boundary condition where you just like stay on the line between person, not person. As, at one point in the talk, I show a woman in a dress with a bunch of license plates, and she still very much looks like a woman, but because there's so many license plates, it, uh, it spams the math so that um, it, the, the confidence goes towards the license plates rather than humans. Um, and in the same way, like masks may be uh, an adversarial uh, attack in the short term against facial recognition systems. Um, there are, you know, no shortage of public fit pictures of people in masks. Um, you know, you could, it wouldn't be hard to take, uh, to, to, to train a model on like a larger set of data and then fine tune it to work with masks. Uh, if you only have pictures of like, say just celebrities in masks, but want to see how this applies to regular people, like um, it, 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 so DHS is worried about masks, um, being effective in stopping facial recognition. And as far as I'm aware, during the George Floyd protests, the facial, the people caught by facial recognition were not wearing masks, but it, like, it is trivially math, it is like trivial from a technological standpoint to make a new system that doesn't care about the masks. So do you have any suggestions for oversight or auditing of the algorithms and their effects? Any recommendations or any ideas? So, um, so I'm gonna, I would defer to, uh, jo again, to Joy's research on this. Um, in the last couple of years, she's developed an auditing platform uh, available through Media Lab, uh, at a, like media, she works at Media Lab at MIT. Um, I don't have the link handy, um, but uh, Joy Bulamwini for people listening out there. Um, and she's a, a black woman who is far more equipped um, to talk about how these things affect her community. And, uh, I would, and I was just trying to get to like some of the more root cause. Um, and I don't know if there's a solution other than open sourcing these models. Um, in another case, there's um, the, a model that guides sentencing guidelines um, called Compass, which uh, is trained on previous um, arrest data and previous recidivism data which uh, knowing what we know about the US justice system has its historical racism problems. So it's trained on historically racist data and, um, it, and someone uh, sued Compass, uh, sued for, uh, to release this data and they, were, and they lost. They were not allowed to see what was making the decision in the model because it was proprietary, even though it was being used by public courts. And so I, I don't think courts are equipped to handle this and um, I'm sure many of you will agree with this if you think of some of the Facebook Congress interview questions and how lost our legislative branch seems to be against the tech sector. 
Indeed. Well, we're at time, but thank you so much for the talk, Charlie. You thank know, you. It's really fast and enlightening for all of us and, and very important in this you know, particular time that we live in. So on behalf of HOPE 2020, all our attendees and presenters and volunteers, thanks for sharing this with us today. Thank you. Bye. All right, everyone.